Hello, I'm Harvey Harkin, and this is Harking Back, a podcast about the pop culture of a lifetime. Whose life? Mine. I'm going back through every year I've been alive and finding out what was going on in that year. This week we're looking at 1986. Great year. 80s have really found their form in 86. A lot of good shit came out this year, and I'm really starting to remember what was going on in my life. Uh, things I found out that were going on. Things like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inducts its first members. People like Chuck Berry, James Brown, Ray Charles, Buddy Holly... Little Richard, Elvis Presley, and more who were not big enough names to be included in that original one. You know when there's a big list of names and they're like, it's so-and-so and and -and so-and-so and more. And if you are in the and more category, you are not as big. You're just not as big shit. You're not a leading man or name. Sorry. It'd be nice being in a Hall of Fame, I think. Closest I'll ever get to being in a Hall of Fame is uh, in comedy clubs. Sometimes they put up pictures of comedians. And I'd never had that. And then I got my picture up. At, uh, at a comedy club. It was Top Secret Comedy in London. And I saw my picture up there. I was like, holy shit, I've made it. And then they took it down. <laughs> it sounds really harsh. It sounds like um, they assured me it's not because I was awful. Uh, they were restructuring. And they took a bunch of, uh, of pictures down that they never put back up. I'm not bitter. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's fine. But Jesus, you spend a lot of time waiting for your picture to get up. And then they, you go, where the... Hey, did I have a picture there? Yeah, we took that shit down. Yeah, you know what you did. You know what you did. Uh, Also in 86, Voyager 2 flies past Uranus. Oh, grow up. Grow up. Seriously. Um, The Dalai Lama in 86 meets Pope John Paul II in India. And I'm guessing could only be a religious dick measuring contest. I mean, the Dalai Lama is the biggest in his religion. Pope John Paul II is the biggest in his it would have been awkward them meeting and just going, um, so does everyone just do everything you want? They're like, yeah, yeah, everything's just, everyone just does everything I want. I mean, they totally would have been sitting there going, uh, whose religion is better? And also, who's going to last longer? And uh, by the way, Dalai Lama totally wins. Totally wins. Pope versus Dalai Lama, choose Dalai Lama all the time. There's been like four Pope, there's been like four Popes since Pope John Paul II. And there's only been one Dalai Lama. At this point, it's like, like the Dalai Lama is like Hugh Jackman, and uh, the Pope's are like Batman. At that point, you know, like there's only been one Wolverine. There's been Batman come and go. They come and go. Dalai Lama would have been like, "Yeah, nice to meet you, Pope. It's good. It's good. I'll just wait till the next one if I don't like you." Uh, later on, the Pope then just uh, later on the Pope met with Mother Teresa, and presumably talked about what a dick the Dalai Lama was. I can only imagine. Also in '86, Pixar animation starts. Pixar. Yes, the people that made Toy Story and all those movies from your childhood that you loved, right? They started in 86. Toy Story came out in 95. So nine years working up to Toy Story. I wonder if the other companies were like, hey, Pixar, you started in 86. Are you doing anything yet? You doing anything yet? You doing anything yet? And Pixar would have been like, you just fucking wait. You just wait. I'm going to make a movie that's going to be completely computer generated and animated and it's going to make fucking shitloads. I don't know if you've ever seen the original story or like the original story ideas or concept, but apparently in the first drafts, Woody was a real dick. And it wasn't until executives came in and, and watched it. They were like, you guys realize your protagonist is an absolute asshole, right? And they went, oh, shit. I thought just because we made him toys, everyone would love him. And they're like, no, no, no. They're just going to make them hate cowboy toys even more. Uh, 86, your Brenner came out with that famous I am dead now anti-smoking ads that are on TV. Uh, I know about these from Bill Hicks records, if you guys re- remember those. Bill Hicks, um, not Bill Hicks, Yul Brenner, famous actor from The King and I and The Magnificent Seven. He smoked cigarettes and he recorded these ads going, I'm Yul Brenner and I'm dead now because I smoke cigarettes. Which would have been a weird one to film. I wonder how, I didn't look into it, but I wonder how close to his death he filmed these and then they came out and everyone would have gone, are we going to run those ads still? He's really dead now. I haven't seen any sort of campaign like that since. There's no like, hey, I'm Whitney Houston and I'm dead now because I fucking got addicted to heroin. Is that what she addicted to? I think so. 
Oh, man. Or the cranberries one that died in the bath. Anyway, this is very depressing. I'm going to move on from this. Um, the Beatles in 86. Rec Beatles records officially go on sale in Russia. They do. And apparently they cleaned up. So they go on sale in Russia. Oh, if only the Beatles had a track that could be, you know, really appropriate to this. Oh, shit. That's right. Imagine having that ace up your sleeve to play. Oh, yeah, we've already got a song. It's called Back in the USSR. We released it in 1968. Hey guys, we're going to release these records in Russia. Do you have anything appropriate? We fucking do. We've got the best single to launch this with. You're not going to believe this coincidence. What else? There was a keepy uppy, a keepy uppy uh, record for football. 14 hours and 14 minutes of keepy uppy with a football. Uh, thwarted because they passed it to me. Anytime I'm in a group of guys and they've got football comes out and they start doing keepy uppy. I don't know what it is about British guys, English guys, British guys, like... They could just do they could just do keepy uppy, right? Just bounce that ball. It goes to me, boom, it immediately goes over the fence, through a window, and everyone just becomes incredibly disappointed at me. I don't know what it is, just in their DNA. Even people that do not look sporty at all, they've just got it with the foot. Anyway, speaking of sports, Kareem Abdul Jabbar in eighty six scores his thirty four thousandth Did I get that right? Yeah, thirty thirty four thousandth career point. In the NBA. Now, I'm not big on the sports, but I just this one caught my eye because he held this record. So no one else in the NBA had scored as many points as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, that massively tall guy that Bruce Lee fights at the end of Game of Death. Um, he holds this record for 33 years until LeBron fucking James comes and overtakes it. You know what the worst thing is about that for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? He holds it. He's held it for 33 years. He's feeling pretty good about it. And then fucking LeBron James comes out and breaks it. It's not like Kareem can go, I'm going to break it back. Like he's not coming out of retirement at 76, you know? He's just got to go, oh, fuck, I, I held it for a while. That was good. In 86 was the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, the Challenger disaster, and the Lionel Richie disaster, to which I'm referring to Dancing on the Ceiling. Fuck, I hate that song. It's so cheesy. It's so cheesy. Oh, what a feeling. It's like we're dancing on the ceiling. What the fuck? It's got strong 1950s rock and roll hangover vibes. It really does. And you know what? It's only... That's how good Lionel Richie is. This piece of shit song. And he's selling it like it's gold. Like he's being an absolute professional in this. In the music video, watching me smiling away. He's dancing. He's feeling it. He is selling it. Well done, Lionel Richie. But I hate that fucking song. It is so cheesy. Uh, also in 86, Cher went on David Letterman and called him an asshole on his show. I, I saw this and I had to go back and look it up on, on YouTube. You can watch this interview if it's on YouTube. Um, there's something about them. Like, they they come out. You, he invites Cher. He's like, please welcome my guest Cher. And you can tell they're immediately antagonistic towards each other. I don't know what had been led up to this. But you can tell they're just willing to have a go at each other. They can't fucking wait. Like, the first thing Ledman starts with, he goes, you smell great. Right? And she's clearly talking about her perfume or whatever, but what a way to say that. Not like, what is that fragrance? What's that lovely scent? You smell great, Cher. What a great fuck you and welcome to my show. She says, so Letterman says, you smell great. And she just crosses her arms and you can just see her go into beast mode. And you can just tell that she's hated him for so long. Anyway, you can check it out. It's a show where Cher called David Letterman an asshole. And he is. He is. He knows it. She knows it. Everybody knows it. And I'm like, I wish there was more of this on TV these days. Just go on, like, fucking, some of these, oh, who, who's the guy that does the, um, the British one? Oh, God, it's just gone from my head. He uh, narrates Eurovision every year. Oh, oh, God, yes, listener, I can hear you just calling out his name. Oh, I had a friend that used to work on his show, and she said he was such a prick. Oh, it's all in the UK where they get all the big celebrities. Um, I'm not looking it up. It's just, I'm just going to, it's going to come back to me. Okay. It's going to come back to me. And I know you're sitting there frustrated going, it's so and so. And I know it. It's not, it's not Jonathan Ross. Fuck. I refuse to look it up. I, I'm just going to have to like get in my brain in there somewhere. It's going to come back to me. Jesus Christ. Yes. I feel your frustrations. It'll come back. Anyway, I wish someone would go on there and go, you are just sometimes a bit of a dick. All right. Uh, if, I don't know this. In 86, The Late Show with Joan Rivers premieres. Joan Rivers, fucking legend. Love her. Uh, she's fired by 1987. 
Probably for being a legend. You know Joan Rivers. Says what she, whatever the fuck she wants. Go, Joan Rivers. You deserved more. Yeah. Um, American tennis player in 86. Anne White stuns Wimbledon by wearing a white lycra bodysuit in her first round match. I love it when people just... Because, you know, they've got this, this dress code at Wimbledon. You've got to wear white. And she just goes, oh, white. It's just going to be white? Okay, gotcha. Lycra body stocking. Eat that. Enjoy my camel toe through this distinguished tennis match. Like, I love it when people just give this big middle finger to the establishment. Like, turning up to a black tie event. And only a black tie. And going, hey, technically, this is the dress code. Eat a dick. This one, you can see specifically. 86, Argentina wins the FIFA World Cup. It was in Mexico, and they bet West Germany 3-2. Bet West Germany. I wonder if that's satisfying. You bet half a country. I wonder if the Germans like, yeah, this is only the West Germany? We're going to go get the rest of the country, unite, and we're going to come back and fuck things up. As well they did. Oh, this is interesting. Did not know this. In 86, um, New Zealand makes gay sex legal. Didn't, yeah, make gay sex. However, gay marriage would have to wait until 2013. Which seems like a little bit of a tease. Kind of like, okay, you can have your gay sex, okay? Okay, but don't make it too serious, okay? Don't get too attached. Just keep it sexy. Um, also in 86, 3D short film, Captain EO with Michael Jackson premieres at Disney Parks. I saw this. I remember as a kid, I, I don't know how old I was, maybe three-ish, I think. Um, and it was fucking terrifying. Like Michael Jackson's just coming at you out of the screen. And other monsters and stuff. Um, this is the time when those 3D glasses were all the rage. You know, the, the black, one, you know, one eye's black, one eye's, not what, not black, uh, one eye's blue, one eye's red, or green and red, or something like that. And they kind of worked, but like you'd, you'd go, oh, that's awesome for five seconds, and then everyone would have a migraine for the next four hours. Anyway, I just, I saw it. I think it was really kind of futuristic. Like it was like Michael Jackson is on a spaceship and he comes and saves the world by dancing. I wonder if the writers were there having writers like, okay, Michael comes down and come on, people, hit me, hit me. What does he do? Uh, sing? No, it's been done. Hit what else we got? Uh, he dances? Love it. Let's go. Moonwalking. Um, Oprah had, Oprah came on the scene in 86. First broadcast nationally, 86, Oprah. And fuck you, Oprah, for ruining every audience's expectations for every show that is not yours. Because if you go on Oprah, you know you're going to get some swag. You know you're going to get some like, Oh my god, what's that guy's name? It starts with... The, Graham Norton! It's Graham Norton! I told you I'd remember. Graham fucking Norton. I told you I would remember. The Graham Norton show. Yes. I, he is such a snivelly little shit when he, when he commentates Eurovision every year. He's just sitting there like, Oh, mm, look what they're trying to do there. <laughs> That's a bit shit. <laughs> Shut up, Graham. You with your cushy couch. Anyway, I had a friend that worked on a show and she said he was a bit of a cunt. Anyway. Graham Norton. I knew it would come to me. You know those things sometimes when you try to remember, the best thing you can do is just go, try to remember really hard for about 20 seconds and then go, okay, subconscious, you take over now. Away you go. Graham Norton. Yes. Nailed it. Yeah, I know. You're sitting there going, yeah, I knew this five minutes ago, mate. It's no big deal. You remembered something. Hurrah. Do you want a medal? Right. What was I saying? Oprah. Yeah. If you go on Oprah, you, as an audience member, you just... You know why they're delusional? You know why they're sitting there screaming their heads off? It's because they know they're like in a feeding frenzy, but it's like a consumer frenzy because they know they're going to get some awesome shit. Like, you know, it's always like, look under your chair. There's a fucking, there's a fucking trip to Hawaii or something. I, um, I looked up, look up. Um, so here's some things that Oprah has given to her audiences. Uh, Spanx. What are Spanx? Is they like special undies that hold your tummy in? I want some Spanx. Um, Thousand dollar loaded credit cards. Cashmere sweaters, which is an oxymoron, like cashmere is actually the last thing you want to sweat in. Um, Burberry coats, audience members have been given diamond watches, cruise holidays, Pontiac cars. The fuck, you, can you imagine? Everyone, hey, by the way, everyone sitting here, um, if you told people, like, everyone's got a chocolate bar under their seat, everyone go like, oh, that's right. If you told everyone in the audience today is getting a car, you'd be like, what the shit? Um... It's funny, I actually found out this, that the, the first time, because so they gave away two cars. They gave away the Pontiacs one time, and then later on, they gave away uh, Volkswagen Beetles when they relaunched them. Um, but with the Pontiacs, 
uh, they were just like, you got the car, but now you've been loaded with all the taxes and, and all the costs that come with the car. And some people were like, Ugh. so they sorted that out when they uh, gave away the Volkswagen Beetles. I mean, fuck. That's still too much money, isn't it? Don't worry. We can give cars away again. We've sorted it out now. We'll, we've made it so we can give people cars and they won't get pissed off. Welcome to America. Um, here we go. I looked into movies that came out of 1986. What a glut of memorable movies. I love these. Um, a Better Tomorrow with Chow Yun-Fat premieres in Hong Kong. I love this because this, around this time, Hong Kong movies are on the roll. They're really picking up with like Jackie Chan movies, Chow Yun-Fat movies. Um, John Woo directed A Better Tomorrow. And it's just, if you heard, ever heard the term gun fu, it comes from John Woo. He directed Face Off, if you're not familiar with Hong Kong cinema. And basically, he's just like, I like brutal gunfights, slow motion, and doves. Let's go. Let's make a movie. John Woo also directed Mission Impossible 2. If you remember how batshit crazy Mission Impossible 2 was compared to Mission Impossible 1, that's John Woo and Tom Cruise working together and just going, let's just keep wanking. Let's do it. Um, An American Tale. Do you remember that animated movie, American Tale, about Fievel, the Russian mouse that moves to America? I remember this. As a kid, I loved it. And it's not till you, you look back and I realize that before they move from Russia to America, every every little mouse wants to go from Russia to America. And um, they sing a song before they go. And they sing, there are no cats in America. They would sing, oh, they'd be like, why do you want to go? There are no cats in America. Basically, there are no obstacles in America. And then they get there and they're like, oh my God, there are so many fucking cats here. It is such a um, an allegory to being a migrant. And it's so deep. And they just packed into this little movie about a mouse with baggy clothing. Oh, it's really sad. You should check it out. Now, I remember they made a sequel to that called Five All Goes West. And I was like, no, you've lost the magic here. Five All, what are you doing? You're from Russia, mate. Take those spurs off. Get out of here with that shit. Oh, a little movie called Labyrinth came out in 86. Uh, with Jim, you know, directed by Jim Henson. Starring David Bowie, Jennifer Connelly. Oh, man, they don't make him like this anymore. This like if they even tried anything like this, like it would be computer generated wank. Like back then, they had to make every little puppet. Everything was super practical. You got David Bowie in puppets. You know that there's that trend right now where they kind of think of like think of a movie, and just like keep one actor and replace the rest with with Muppets. Essentially, that was Labyrinth, but the Muppets were way darker. Um, Labyrinth was an amazing movie, and it scared the living shit out of me. Like all the little goblin puppets and stuff. Ugh. Horrendous. And there's a scene where they've got these little, um, oh, these little red skinny gangly puppets. And they start singing a song. And they start decapitating themselves. Like they can just pull their heads off and throw them around. And I was not prepared for that. Like I just remember they were dancing. And they looked a little bit creepy. And then one of them yanked their head off and kept singing. And I just screamed. Because I was four at the time. Labyrinth. What a goddamn... Oh, such a good movie. I need to go back and watch it. I can't watch it with my kid. She's six. I know she'd lose her shit. This is the thing. Movies in the 80s were fucking terrifying for kids, but they built up stamina. Or traumatized. I don't know. I still can't watch scary movies these days. I, I can't do it. I refuse. The last scary movie I watched was The Ring, the American one, uh, in like uh, 2003? Something like that. 2003, 2004. Um... And I just can't watch scary movies ever because people that can watch scary movies, they can just go, people that like them can tend to do this thing where they're like, oh, I like being scared for two hours in the cinema or at watching it at home. And then I can forget that and enjoy my experience and go about my day. I can't do that. If I watch a scary movie, it stays with me. I keep thinking about it long after the credits have rolled. And that night, I know I'm going to be lying in bed as a full ass grown man. Just sitting there, full ass, full ass grown man. It's a grown ass man. That's what I meant to say. But I said full ass grown man. <laughs> Which, you know what I'm trying to say, but that sounded worse. It's a, it's a grown ass man. Fuck it, I'm sticking with it. As a full ass grown man, I'll be lying there in bed, terrified, not being able to go to the toilet because the monster from the movie will come out and get me. Anyway, Labyrinth. I think it traumatized me a little bit. Um... Ferris Bueller's Day Off is an 86. I've never watched this movie all the way through, but I've, every bit of it I've watched, I find Ferris Bueller fucking insufferable. 
he is this is my second contrary point to this podcast the first being i don't like dancing on the ceiling and the second being ferris bueller is an annoying prick like the older i get the more ugh, i don't like these He's he's a dick. He's a prick. He gets his friends into trouble. There's one friend that's the voice of reason who's always going, "Hey mate, I don't think we should do this." And Ferris Bueller's like, "Hey, chill out, man. Stop being a square or whatever the fuck he says." As he puts his feet up and his hands behind his head. Oh, oh, I find him so annoying. The older I get, the more I kind of like side with like the teachers on this in this movie and stuff like that. You know, what? I've never, I've never been a fan of like movies where kids are the heroes and they're like they're like mischievous annoying kids and like the adults who are trying to stop their fun like end up falling in a mud ditch on their bum bum and then all the kids laugh and shit i hate that shit i didn't even like it as a kid i always found the kids so annoying and i was always like it's blind luck this all turned out in your favor you know you know what really really boils my piss is um movies as a kid where kids could beat up adults I'm not talking about Home Alone because he actually kind of set up traps and stuff. I'm talking, there was a movie called Three Ninjas about three brothers. And like the oldest is like 11 and the youngest is like six. And they run around at the end of the movie like beating up full grown men. And I remember watching that just going, this is bullshit. Like that man, one punch from that man, you're dead. All right. Anyway, so that's that's kind of feeds through to why Ferris Bueller's Day Off is annoying to me uh aliens comes out in 86 what a film aliens i've got so much to say about aliens first of all it totally changes the genre from alien to aliens ridley scott directs alien it's a thriller it's it's a scary you know claustrophobic monster on a ship we're defenseless what's going to happen here movie it's great aliens is an action movie through and through and Sigourney, if you want to talk about, you know, strong female protagonist, oh, look no further than Ripley. What a fucking boss, right? Space, you got it all. You got Space Marines, aliens. You got Bill Paxton shitting his pants. That might be the highlight of the movie for me. Game over, man. Game over. Him just losing his shit. You got the um, you got the stereotypical Sarge like I love a day in the car. Every every meal's a banquet. Every paycheck a fortune. Love it. He's got the cigar. Stole that shit, Hudson. Love it. He's real hoorah. And, um, oh, shit. One of the best comebacks in, in movie history. You remember you got Vasquez, that really, like, fucking stacked Latino woman, right? This Latina. And she's like, they wake up out of cryo sleep, these Marines. And she's doing, like, uh, pull-ups on a bar. And Hicks comes up to her and goes, hey, Vasquez, you ever been mistaken for a man? And she goes, no. Have you? Oh! <laughs> like, turn it off there. Like it's, we're done here. It's so good. Oh, what a film. And then Alien Queen. Ripley comes back. You will know it. You will know it. It's great. Go watch it again. Right fucking now. It's so good. Uh, the Color of Money comes out in 86, which is an underrated, unheard of by a lot of people um, movie about pool hustling with a young Tom Cruise and I mean young Tom Cruise, right? And Paul Newman. This is actually a sequel to a movie called The Hustler, I think. Someone's going to prove me wrong. Where Paul Newman was a young Paul Hustler. And now he's older and he takes on a young mentor with Tom Cruise. It is great. It's slick. It's sexy. It's well written. It's paced well. It's ugh, it's a good fucking movie that wouldn't come out today. Because they'd be like, where's the franchise potential? Can we make this a multi-universe movie? I don't know if we want to waste the money. Yes, you should waste the money on this. It's fucking great. Um, Flight of the Navigator came out in 86. It's a, this is, I've got a list of movies uh, that I am hell-bent sure that they're going to be made into reboots or remakes soon. And uh, Flight of the Navigator is right up there. About a kid that gets abducted or, abducted? or taken on board a spaceship. Uh, for some reason and he comes back from being on the spaceship and it turns out he's the rest of the world has aged eight years later and he goes on adventures in the spaceship and it's got it all it's got like the ai kind of like spaceship control thing called max who always said compliance if you remember that anyway mark my words flight of the navigator is going to be made into a modern movie all right they're going to be remake it and by the way flight of the navigator starred a young sarah jessica parker google it youtube it you can see her there she has a little a little part Stand By Me comes out in 86. Fucking great. Fucking great movie. 
In Keith of Sutherland, you play a great villain. You do. Blue Velvet by David Lynch came out. And a lot of people, like, there seems to be like a David Lynch cult. Like, people that liked Twin Peaks and, like, they were all about, like, oh, it's, it's amazing to react. I watched Blue Velvet. It was fine. It's fine. Like, it's not super indulgent. It's not super entertaining either. But I don't know if you like your kind of slow, quirky films like that. Fine, yeah. But just don't be one of these David Lynch fans that comes and goes like, oh my God, no, what you've missed is... No, I watched it. I had my opinion. I didn't find it entertaining. Sorry if I don't drool over David Lynch. All right. Transformers the movie came out. Oh, that was a tough one. Spoiler alert, they killed Optimus Prime off in this one pretty early on in the movie. And... And that was tough, watching Optimus Prime die. And it's even tougher when you get older. They did it so they could kill him off, so they could introduce new robots, so they could sell more toys. Get fucked! Get fucked. However, the biggest betrayal was that Transformers, the animated series itself, was made so they could sell the toys. Oh, never grow up. Never look behind the curtain. Okay, here are the, um, according to Box Office Mojo, the top five movies for 1986, the ones that made the most money around the world. At number five, it's Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Never saw it, but apparently this the even-numbered Star Treks are the good ones. You let me know. At number four, it was Karate Kid Part Two. Again, I will maintain that the Karate Kid, never that good at karate. My friend Gary always talks about this, that at the end of the movie when... Um, He's doing that climactic fight and uh, he gets the support and he kind of looks at Mr. Miyagi and he goes in the nod of like, yes, now tap into your karate. And what he does is he just keeps punching the other guy in the face with not much technique. Like just just turns out the guy's weakness was getting punched in the face over and over and over and over again. I mean, it was a really nice premise. They go to Japan this time. So they're in Mr. Miyagi's territory. He's got a past. Some guy's out for revenge. That was cool. But ultimately his karate... Is not very good. Uh, number three was Platoon with uh, Charlie Sheen. Remember when Charlie Sheen was still a shit hot actor and we all took him seriously? Yeah. This is the one with the kind of like, if you've watched it, there's a scene where uh, I think Willem Dafoe is running through the jungle and it's this is the classic shot where he just gets shot fucking hundreds of times and then like all the squabs go off and he just falls down to his knees with his hands up and it's like the, the brutality of war and everything but that has just been overdone in so many movies Tropic Thunder does a really good um, take on that number two Crocodile Dundee this movie went like this little movie from Australia what the fuck went absolute gangbusters and it's still quoted, quoted these days that's not a knife this is a knife it's great it's fucking great and Australians well done to you you absolutely got a banger there. Well done. And number one movie in 1986, Top Gun. Holy shit, what a film. Top Gun. By the way, um, I know I will talk about this in years to come, but uh, I went to go see Maverick, the sequel, and I think my jaw was on the floor for most of it. Like, Top Gun was a huge movie. Like, looking back, Top, Top Gun was 80s testosterone masked as a fighter pilot movie about pilots in the Navy. What I found out about this, so what they did was they need, they made a deal with the U.S. Navy, which um, was we use some footage of your planes. You let us shoot your actual planes, right, with the film camera, and you let us do some shit with them. And the Navy said, well, okay, but you let us put Army recruitment officers sign-up booths outside the cinemas that they play at. So people go watch the movie, they come out, and there's a little sign-up. Hey, do you want to be Tom Cruise? And everyone goes, fuck yeah. And like... Navy recruitment went through the roof this year because of it. And also the sale of Aviator Ray-Ban sunglasses, as they should, that classic shape. Um, I found out something that they were only allowed to um, shoot a missile from a plane once. They were only allowed to shoot it once. The Navy only said, okay, you can have one missile because these things cost so much fucking money. And also we can't just be shooting off missiles willy-nilly. Can you believe it? The US said this. I can't believe it. Anyway. So they filmed it once and they filmed it again. And it, sorry, not again, but they filmed it from multiple different angles. And every time you see in this movie, uh, the, one of the American planes shooting a missile, it's the same missile. And once you know that, you can't unsee it. It's just being shot from a different angle again and again and again. Movie magic. Um, Top Gun, that was so good. So good. And that's, that's what I'm saying. No, so 80s, um, Top Gun was 80s, this, uh, 80s testosterone. And Maverick is a fighter plane movie. 
Remember when Top Gun came out and then they said, we're going to make a sequel 30 years later. I remember when this was first announced. I, I remember going, this is bullshit. It's going to suck. There's no way you can do this and make it good. And it's better than Top Gun. Fight me. Fight me on this. All right. Uh, let's go and move into songs of 86. Uh, that song, That's What Friends Are For. It's released by uh, Dion Warwick. Elton John, Gladys Knight, and Stevie Wonder. Holy shit, what a lineup. Uh, it was released for AIDS charity. And it's a touching song about the importance of friends during times of hardship. However, it is also a very hard to announce that you've written a song for an AIDS chattery, charity, an AIDS charity called That's What Friends Are For, and not have it sound like you gave your friends AIDS. Just saying, just saying, heart's in the right place. All our minds went there, Okay. Also, John Lennon, Live in New York City album is released posthumously, which suffers from a similar problem. And this is why we can't have nice things. Metallica's Master of Puppet album releases. I don't know much. Of, I've never been a Metallica fan, but I think I've got enough Metallica fans around me that I, uh, I've picked up a little bit through osmosis. Like I, found, I suddenly found myself going like, oh, Into Sandman, I do like this one. It's good. And Master of Puppets. Is that what they played at the end of Stranger Things? Like Eddie... Anyway, you know what I'm talking about if you do. Um, Madonna's, M Madonna's? M Madonna's, <laughs> sorry, that's my fucking bastard. I don't know where that came from. Madonna's Papa Don't Preach number goes, uh, number one for two weeks. Papa Don't Preach. I listened to a lot of Madonna as a kid because my older sister was into Madonna and I did not have uh, money to buy albums. So there was a period there where she had total reign on the music in our house. And because of it, I like a lot of her songs. Madonna's and um and Mariah Carey oh absolute bangers um Bon Jovi releases their third album which is called Slippery When Wet Slippery When Wet you know exactly what you're doing with a title like that John Bon Jovi got oh, you guys sexy guy guys a sexy guy remember I've got a friend in, in New Zealand Kathleen hey how you doing um Bon Jovi came to New Zealand and like this is when he's well into his 60s at this point and she was still like oh John Bon Jovi oh he's still got it imagine that imagine best being like fucking pussy magnet for 40 years 45 years I don't know he's nailing it uh Beastie Boys License to Ill album goes number one rap album on the Billboard charts uh with black rappers fucking fuming I'm assuming um, I love the Beastie Boys. I do. They've kind of disowned their first album because it was really over-commercialized. And you know that song, the most famous song from that album is You Gotta Fight For Your Right To Party? They refuse to play it now. They fucking hated it. They even hated it back then. I think they had to do it on like a, a television performance. And uh, they weren't allowed to do it live. They had to lip sync it. So in protest, while they're doing it, they're all just throwing their microphones in the air while the, the track's still playing <laughs> love the beastie boys um top five songs of 86 here we go uh number five broken wings by mr mister that's a great name mr mister that uh, take these broken wings learn to fly again learn to live so free. um number four on my own by patty labelle and michael mcdonald i didn't know this one i listened to it i've instantly forgotten it f forgotten it i can't tell you what it's about and number three, I Miss You by a band called Climax, but it's spelt K-L-Y-M-A-X-X. -X. Again, you know exactly what you're doing. Um, our band's called Ejaculate, but it's spelt with um, E and then Jack, J-A-X. Like, it's, you know what you're doing. Like, all these things that sound like sexy things, but we're not really sexy things, but we are. We're Climax, and it's called I Miss You. <laughs> this is a song for people that have not had an orgasm in fucking ages. And now, I miss you, Climax. Um, number two, Say You, Say Me by Lionel Richie. Uh, again, I didn't really know it. I listened to it. Again, I've instantly forgotten it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, and at number one, That's What Friends Are For, that song. Really, a really soppy top five in 86. Like, I think they were really going for, um, I don't know, watching a lot of <sighs> soppy shit in 86. Like, these, these songs all kind of sound like they could be soap opera theme songs, if you know what I mean. They were just very soft and like, there's no, where's the rock? Where's the hard shit? Anyway, they've got their place, I guess, I guess. Um, in video games, top five video games. This is from fandom.com at number five. Um, it is a, uh, it's a tie. It's a tie with Ikari Warriors, 
which is like a run and gun game. Uh, Matt Mania, which is a wrestling one. And it reminds me about the, the, have you seen the movie The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke? About a wrestler that was big in the 80s and now it's him in like modern day and he's just like, got, he's got nothing. He's, 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 his body's fucked from a career of wrestling. He's estranged from his daughter. He's just living, you know, he's living in a trailer. He's just living a shit life. Um, and he's got a little uh, next door neighbor's kid as his friend and they hang out sometimes. And he comes over and he goes, hey, you want to play Nintendo? And he's got this old NES system with like a wrestling game with him, Randy the Ram in it. And they're playing it and um, the kid's just playing it going, oh my God, this is so fucking old. Just, it even adds to the to the tragedy because it's like, yeah, I was in a video game. And no, this video game's so old. Anyway, number four, a game called Gradius. Never heard of it. It's a side scrolling shooter, I think. Uh, number three, a little game called Super Mario Brothers. Can you believe this? Super Mario Brothers, one of the most famous games ever and it came at number three when it came out. People, like, there are, you'll probably come across a Super Mario's meme, Mario Brothers meme, three times a week. Easy. Easy if you're, like, looking at anything on the internet. That's the appeal of this game. Like, they made a movie about it. They made several movies about it, actually. Uh, the first one from the 90s with Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo. Oh, what a fucking car crash. We will get into that in due time. Don't you worry. Um... My cousins were the kind of ones that could just smash Super Mario Brothers. They knew all the places to go, all the secret hideouts. I think I already talked about this. Sorry. This is unedited. Again, as you know, this is just me rambling into a mic for about 40 minutes. So if I've said it, I'm going to do this. I'm going to repeat myself a lot because I'm old as well and my memory sucks. Uh, number two of top five video games of 86 was Outrun. Is this the one with the Ferrari? Anyway, driving game. And number one, Hang On. A little motorcycle racing game. I can't wait till we get to the years where I can really sink my teeth into the video games more because these ones I don't really, I never really played. Okay. Uh, also, Times Person of the Year in '86 was Corazon Aquino. I said that wrong. I'm sure I did. Corazon Aquino, um, which was the elected president of the Philippines after a 20-year dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos. Well, fucking done. I mean, I told you I'm not political, but anyone that overthrows a dictator is like, yeah, shit changes now. The people love me. Well done. Times person of the year. Get them to it. Uh, what was going on in my life? In 86, my family moved to New Zealand from Florida. I remember we stayed in a, in a motel, I think near Bishopdale. We moved to Christchurch, New Zealand, and we stayed in a motel, I think near Bishopdale, I think. And one of my very first memories of New Zealand was playing in like the little playground that uh, was part of the motel. And I made a friend called Mark, and he said, um, would you like to come to my house for a Cheerio? You know, like the, you know those little um, Savaloy sausages that you dip in tomato sauce. Oh, I love those. I love those so much. I remember turning up to kids' parties, and if there was a bowl of those, I'd be like, I'm not fucking moving until all those are gone. That's what happens next. Anyway, he said, would you like, would you like to come to my house for a Cheerio? And I had to go ask my parents. And of course, they didn't. I said, can I go to Mark's for a Cheerio? And they were like, what the fuck's a Cheerio? Is, is it drugs? Is it drugs? We just moved to this country. I don't know what's going on here. Is that a doobie? I don't know what that is. That was one of my first memories. Um, also, oh my God, this shows you. Uh, am I going to get my parents into trouble for this? Uh, I don't know if I will. But every day we used to go to... Um, Fuck it, I'll tell you. Every day we used to go to from the motel to the supermarket, or like every second day or whatever. And the supermarket, you had to cross a busy main road to get to the supermarket. And we'd all go as a family. And then one day I said, I, I think I said, I don't want to go. And my parents were like, okay, if you don't want to go, you stay here, okay? And I'm four, by the way. I'm fucking four-year-old. <laughs> um, they go, okay, you stay here if you're not going. This is 80s parenting. And so they go and they lock the motel. And immediately, five minutes after they go, I'm going, oh, I've got FOMO. I'm missing out. So I try to leave to go join them. I put on my gum boots and um, I can't get out. The door's locked. And so I squeeze out through a window that still has a catch on it, but I'm four. So I've got like the bones of Mr. Fantastic. So I can out of this. That was a horrendous noise. Sorry about that. I just squeeze out this window and I make my way to the supermarket. And crossing the busy road, I remember I looked both ways. I remember this very clearly. I remember going, okay, got to wait, wait, and then cross. And I turn up at the supermarket and my sister sees me first. And I go, hey. And she goes, what the fuck are you doing here? But in a way, a eight-year-old would say it, which was, mom and dad are going to kill you. 
and uh, I saw mum and dad, and the look on their faces was one of, oh, you are in so much trouble, and also, oh, this could have gone so much badly, so so much worse. We could have, we did not think this through, and uh, we went home, and I got a fucking absolute bollocking. Oh yes, I did. Oh yes, I did. So um, sorry, mum and dad, if this gets you into trouble, but it's fine. Everything turned out fine. This was 86 in New Zealand. Um, yeah, and then I remember joined, we moved. We, our house was getting built. That was part of the deal with Dad's job. He was like, come out to New Zealand for three years. Um, there was a new development in Avonhead, Christchurch. Our house was getting built. That's why we were in a motel. And then we moved in, and I went to kindergarten. And I remember those little plist... Uh, I had a birthday. Remember they'd made... Um, on your birthday, they'd get a jar lid and turn it upside down, and fill it with Play-Doh, and put candles in it. I don't know if they'd still do this these days. Like, um, and they'd light the candles, and then you, everyone sing happy birthday, and then you blow it out, and then look at this Play-Doh cake you've made and not eat it. It was great. I loved it. I felt so special on my first birthday in New Zealand. I remember that. And there was a girl that had a birthday very close to me, a girl called Melanie, and um, we kind of shared birthdays very, very close together. And there's an old photo of me somewhere with me and her getting our Play-Doh cakes. And I've got a little paper hat. That's so 80s. Hey, we're going to light this real flame, put on this like, like, like Christmas thin, instantly flammable paper on your head. Get your head closer. You can blow out the candles. I know you're all four-year-olds. You probably don't have the coordination. I wonder how many kids' heads caught on fire. The 80s. Anyway, uh, that's where I'm going to leave it there. I'm really enjoying uh, doing this podcast. Uh, I know it's a bit rambly at times. I know it's a little bit, what the fuck am I saying? But um, that's, the, that's the whole point of this podcast. I just wanted to be kind of just a bit more unfiltered, a bit less scripted, a bit more raw, and just see what kind of comes out. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you are watching it or listening to it on somewhere that you can leave a rating, that'd be great. Let me know. You can join the Discord. I've got a Discord now set up. So you can go and actually comment on things you hear on the episode. Uh, and if I go, oh, I'm going to leave something there. You can hit me up and go, hey, you said you were going to put this here. Put it here. Do that in the Discord. The link should be where you're watching this or listening to this podcast from. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.